morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earth and Bustles YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. You know, some of you have written to me uh, very fearful, and some of you even tell me that you're having trouble praying because you are fearful. And, you know, when I sought the Lord about this, um, what was revealed to me is that people fall into condemnation because the enemy has accused them and they think that um, they're unworthy to pray. So some of you write to me and ask me to pray for you because you feel that you can't pray yourself and so you want someone else to pray for you. And, and when I asked the Lord about this, it was shown unto me that it's because you feel unworthy to seek the Lord yourself. You feel condemned. Now, of course, I'm happy to pray for you, but that's really not the answer. The answer is for you to see where you're making the mistake here. So Satan is an accuser, and one of the, his favorite ways to operate is to whisper accusations into our mind in the form of doubts and fears. So we, of course, want to please the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to do things that are pleasing unto him. And when we're a new Christian, then the enemy can quickly come in and point out that we have failed in this or that respect. And that's easy enough to do because none of us is perfect when we become a Christian. What has happened at the time of salvation? So when you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Everything that was ever done by you in your life has been washed off of you and God doesn't see it. And another thing that has happened is that, that now you are free from the bondage of the, the condemnation of your past. Then when you receive the Holy Spirit of God, then you have the power of God to overcome sin. And this is where Satan comes in lots of times and gets people. He might say to you, you didn't fully repent. And so he'll say there was something wrong with your salvation. Or he'll say to you something like, well, you haven't received the Holy Ghost yet, so you're not really a child of God. And that's why I want to talk to you, my sisters, because what we want to remember is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And he loved us. He died for us. He gave his life for us while we were yet sinners. So we were not worthy of that. And once we've come to the waters of salvation, so we've been baptized in Jesus' name, that is not the moment where now it God says to us, okay, I saved you now. Now you better measure up or I'm going to put you in the lake of fire. That's ridiculous. And a lot of us fall into that. And the reason why we fall into that is we're not, we're not familiar enough with the mercy of God. Okay, so we want to understand who God is according to his word and not according to our fears. So we don't let our emotions define for us how God is going to treat us. Rather, we look into the word of God and believe what he says. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a little picture of something. We have a young wife. Now just before the, the husband and wife got married, so the, they got married and the marriage was consummated last night. So before last night, when they were still betrothed, but they were, hadn't yet come together to live as husband and wife in a household, that the wife... Whenever she saw her husband, she was delighted to see him. She was eager to please him. She was trying to look pretty for him. She was completely enthralled by anything he said. And she was also eager to confide in him everything that she was concerned about, everything that were her hopes and dreams. Now, after the wedding, this is something that can sometimes happen, and I'm using this is an illustration of the fearful young Christian who is afraid to pray, okay? So now the young wife, uh, the marriage has been consummated. Her husband has gone off to work, and, and she's in the house now for the first day. 
She wants to please him. She's never run a household before. She really doesn't know how to cook. And this is true of most women in the West. So I'm sure many of you can identify. But she wants to please her husband. So she thinks, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, um, I'm going to wash all the crystal. I'm going to polish all, all the furniture. I'm going to uh, wash all of his shirts and iron them. And I'm going to make his favorite meal that I've never made before, which is lasagna, which is a very big project for those of you who have made it. It's not an easy meal to make. But the young woman doesn't know this. And so she sets about to do these things and she gets uh, tangled up and bogged down very quickly. Uh, she's inexperienced with these things and, and she doesn't really know how to do them. And what happens then is that her husband arrives home from work and there's a pile of shirts, his shirts on, on the ironing board that are just all rumpled up and wrinkled. Um, there's a whole bunch of, of uh, things out and, and it, there's a mess that wasn't there before he, he left for work. And there's a faint odor of burning pasta in the air. And he walks in and he sees his wife and she realizes that she lost track of time and that her husband is home and she thinks she's going to displease him. So she looks at him with terror, bursts into tears, runs into the bedroom, slams the door and refuses to come out. Now, this might be something that would be um, remedied um, if the woman, this young wife, were willing to be comforted by her husband. But some young wives in this condition are still trying to be perfect. So say the husband gets her to come out of the bedroom. She tell, cries and tells him what went wrong. He says, let's just go out to eat tonight, honey. It's okay. And he brings her to a restaurant. But the whole time they're in the restaurant, she's like, I can't believe I was that stupid. You must really hate me. I, I'm not a good wife. And, and you can't possibly love a woman like me. So even though he brought her out to dinner, she's not pleased by it. She doesn't recognize his graciousness. And then the next day, she kind of does the same thing. And so the husband becomes frustrated because he can't really comfort his wife. And the wife is feeling more and more inadequate. And then what happens is she starts to think in her mind, well, he's going to get a girlfriend because I'm obviously just no good. She starts to say that to him. So he comes home. Maybe he's a little bit late because he knows probably there isn't going to be dinner. And so he got something to eat on the way home. And he comes in and she says to him, I know you have a girlfriend because I'm just not pleasing you. So she starts to accuse her husband. Is this loving? Is this the way a loving woman treats her husband? Well, no, of course not. The way for this whole thing to be remedied would be for that young woman to say to her husband, I really want to please you and I just don't know how. I'm not a terribly good cook. I've never managed a household before. And then maybe he can say, you know, it doesn't matter to me having lasagna. You can buy that and we can just heat it up if you like. If you want to make me lasagna, you don't have to make it yourself for now, honey. And I don't care about the house. I care about you. You know, I want you to hug and kiss me when I get home. I, I want to talk to you. I married you because I love you, not because I want my house a certain way. It would be nice to have the house orderly, but, you know, I love you, honey. You see, if a woman were to break open her heart before her husband and confide that she knows she's not perfect and let him care for her and be patient with her and guide her in those things, then verily the marriage will be happy. The reason I told you this is because when we read in Ephesians, so let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, and let's read how it is that the church's relationship with Jesus Christ is like a marriage. Let's begin in verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So when we're considering our relationship to Jesus Christ, it's like a bride unto her husband. 
So we want to also relate to Jesus Christ in a loving way, which isn't to go hide in the darkness because we think we're not perfect. And those of you who who are falling into thinking that you're not good enough to pray have fallen into a snare of the devil. That's the opposite of what you need to do. Rather, you need to seek the Lord when you feel inadequate, when you feel you've made mistakes. Because the scripture says that a broken and a contrite heart, he will not despise. So when we feel inadequate, when we feel unworthy, when we feel like we don't know what to do, we don't go and hide in the darkness and try to get ourselves cleaned up. Let's read of this. In verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he knew we weren't perfect. And that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for a bride that loves him. And how do we show our love? By being in relationship with him and trusting him. So let's read on. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So the way that we become righteous isn't by trying to be perfect, of our own strength, and then present our perfection unto the Lord. Rather, it's to be in relationship to him and let him, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So many of you, my sisters, are trying to be holy and without blemish so that you can be in relationship, but you've got it backwards. The only way to be holy and without blemish is to be in relationship. And that is to, yes, dwell in the word, to read the word. But it's not just to dwell in the word. You have to be in prayer. The reason why is if we're reading the word of God, so that we can understand it in order to be righteous. That is like someone who is hiding in the darkness, trying to make themselves righteous in order to present themselves. You see, so that is the woman who's home all day trying to cook the perfect meal and have the house be perfect. She's trying to do that of her own strength rather than having her perfection be in that she's in loving submission unto her husband and letting him show her what is pleasing unto him. Let him guide her. Let him comfort her. Let him teach her. You see, it's about relationship. So when we want to be pleasing to the Lord, we realize that our righteousness is not of ourselves. So let's go to Romans chapter 10. And let's read in verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now this is a specific reference to how the Jewish people try to make themselves righteous by the law. And people who try to make themselves righteous become hypocrites. They either fall into condemnation or they become hypocrites, one or the other. And neither one is good. So falling into condemnation is to fall into fear. And to become a religious hypocrite is to think yourself to be righteous and to be full of pride. And neither one of these things is pleasing unto the Lord. Rather, we want to have the righteousness of God, which comes by faith, which we can read in verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So what is it that we believe in as a Christian? We believe that God is merciful, that he's kind, 
that he sent his only begotten son to die for us because we couldn't save ourselves. That he wants to, us to confide in him. That he promises us that, that he wants us to, to trust him. And that if we do, he, he will show us the way. This is written throughout the scripture, but let's go in particular to Proverbs chapter 3. And let's read one place where this was written. In Proverbs 3. Let's read here in verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You see, when we're trying to make ourselves righteous, we're leaning on our own understanding. When we're trying to read the word of God in order to get right with God, before seeking him, it's backwards. The way that the word of God will clean you. So we read in Ephesians, you know, that Jesus would present unto himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, with the washing of water by the word. What that means is that he washes us by the word when we are seeking him in his word. So it's not to read the word so that we can make ourselves righteous so that then we can approach the throne of grace. It's that we approach the throne of grace and ask him to cleanse us, ask him to guide us, because we trust him. And then we open the word, and then he will direct our paths. So in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. It's a, a fine distinction, but we don't want to fall into perfectionism. Perfectionism leads either to condemnation or hypocrisy, and usually both. So it kind of usually goes back and forth between someone who's hypocritical, thinking, you know, on a good day, they think that they're good and righteous. And on a bad day, they fall into condemnation. And I see this kind of vacillation back and forth with some of you who write to me. One day you're feeling like you're doing well with the Lord because in that particular day, you feel that you've been able to walk in ways that are pleasing unto him. And then on other days, you're full of fear and condemnation. But both of these things are incorrect because we don't make ourselves righteous. It's not about us. It's about him. He's the one who gave us ears to hear and eyes to see and heart to love him and understand. And what he wants from us is our relationship with him, like a wife who loves her husband. So again, let's go back to the bride. The bride who, on her first day home, and her husband's gone to work, that she spends the day thinking, what can I do to please him? Well, I don't really know how to make lasagna, but I know a good restaurant where I could buy some. So I'll go down and buy some and then I'll make the table pretty and I'll put some candles there and we'll have a candlelight dinner. And the husband comes home and his wife is eager to see him because she's been alone all day and just eager to see him. And, and she throws her arms around him and says, oh, honey, I'm so glad to see you. There's lasagna. You want some lasagna? And she's interested in what he has to say. And she tells him that, you know, that she was a little worried about buying it, you know, from a store and not making it. Is that okay? She confides in him her heart. He's going to just love and appreciate that bride. And God is the same way. He's looking on our heart. He's looking on our intentions. He's looking on, do we love him? Or are we relying on our own understanding? Are we trusting him? Or are we trying to make ourselves righteous? Because when we try to make ourselves righteous. We either end up being self-righteously hypocritical and speaking to God in this manner saying, well, you know, I worked hard all day to make lasagna for you. And it's, you know, don't you appreciate me? So we become that way or we become, you must hate me because I can't make lasagna. 
You see, both of these are wrong. So we don't want it to be either one of these things. We want to seek God and trust him, knowing that he loves us. He didn't send his only begotten son to die, to throw us into the garbage heap the minute we make a mistake. As a matter of fact, like any loving father, he finds his children's mistakes a little bit endearing. So when you're a parent and your baby is first learning how to walk and they fall down and they cry, are you mad at them because they fell down? Or do you think it's a little cute? You think it's a little cute. And God is so much better than we are. You see, he's patient. He's long-suffering. He's kind. His mercies extend unto heaven. But one thing that won't please him is if we start treating him like an evil tyrant who just want, is waiting for us to make a mistake so he can throw us into hell. Because that isn't loving at all. And when we treat God that way and continue in that, verily, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy then. We will end up displeasing him. Because a man who has a wife who can't be comforted, who is always trying to be perfect, who's ignoring him, maybe the house is perfect, but he comes home and, and she's not interested in him. She wants him to see how perfect the house is. She thinks that it's to be loving to have all the crystal shining or something. When being loving is about being loving and being interested and warm and receptive and in subjection to one's husband, not in having everything sparkling clean or the perfect meal, you see? And that's what Jesus wants. He wants us to be interested in him. He wants us to rely on him, to trust him. And those of you who have written to me saying, well, could you pray for me? Because my prayer life hasn't been that good because I've been too fearful to pray. Yes, I will pray for you. But really, you know, God is right there. He's just waiting for you to, to stop all this foolishness and start relying on him resting in his arms, trusting him, confiding in him your fears of inadequacy, confiding in him your doubts, telling him what you think your weaknesses are and how you're having trouble overcoming them. And then, then he will do the work in you. So I want to close now again. Let's just go again to Romans. And chapter 10. Let's read in verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So if you believe that God is merciful, if you believe that God sent his son to buy you from your sin, and if you've been baptized in Jesus' name, that is true. You've been purchased back You've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, with your heart you believe unto righteousness. So you trust in the Lord. And then, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So when we love the Lord, we're not confessing to everyone about how we're afraid that God's going to throw us into hell. We're confessing to people about how merciful and kind he is. We're testifying to people about the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ and not the condemnation that comes from trying to make ourselves righteous, you see? So with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. So when we believe what the word of God says, that we were saved from our sins when we were baptized in Jesus' name, that when we're filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God, that then we testify to people about the mercy and truth of Jesus Christ, then, then confession is made unto salvation. This is what the married woman should do. So the married woman wants to please her husband by believing in him, by trusting him, in him, by confiding in him, by relying on him. And she doesn't hide in the darkness trying to be perfect. Rather, she sees that this marriage is because of him. And it's about her relationship to him. It's about loving him. 
I hope that I've clarified this for you, my sisters. No matter what it is you think you've been failing in or inadequate in it, and if the enemy is telling you that you're unworthy to seek the Lord in prayer, then rebuke him. Rebuke the enemy. Tell him, you know, to, to depart from you in the name of Jesus Christ. Because remember, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And we believed his gospel and we'd obey, we obeyed it. So now, now we believe, we believe. And we're not going to allow these doubts to meddle in our marriage. We're not going to allow fear and mistrust and paranoia to be the way in which we conduct ourselves as a Christian. Rather, we conduct ourselves relying on the grace and mercy of God. So the woman who truly trusts her husband is going to confide in him and ask him and seek him and listen to him and follow him. And that's what a Christian does too. I pray this message has been helpful unto you, my sisters. Feel free to write to me. I'm always here for you. Or to comment in the comments section below. And may the word of God go forth today and edify many. In Jesus' name, amen.